Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium show. My name is Jessica. I'm the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight are two of the students who work in the Planetarium, and I will let them introduce themselves, and we'll start with Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm a physics graduate student at UMD. And I'm Eli. I'm a physics undergraduate student at UMD. So this week, um, we wanted to kind of really take a look at um, enjoying and observing the nighttime sky. Now that we're heading into spring, weather's getting better. We know that people are going to start spending more time outdoors. Uh, and for a lot of people, that may mean starting to look at using a telescope, maybe even purchasing their first telescope. Uh, and so that's going to be our focus tonight, is to take a look at some of the basic information that you need to know going into buying a telescope, especially if it's your first one, uh, and also kind of look at what it would look like to use a telescope on a given night. Um, so kind of the steps you may need to go through. And then on Saturday, Lindsay is gonna show us how astrophotography, uh, taking pictures of the night sky is not actually that difficult to get into. Uh, and so we'll take a look at how you can get started in that as well. As always, if you have any questions throughout the show tonight, feel free to leave them down in the comments. Eli will keep an eye on those for me and will let me know uh, when those come up. We'll also have time at the end to take questions as well. And before we get into the show, I have to make sure that everyone has seen this amazing video. Um, if you haven't heard... Uh, with the Perseverance rover that landed on Mars, uh, it had a little helicopter called Ingenuity. And this was an experiment to prove kind of proof of concept. Can we fly on Mars? And they did their first test flight really early Monday morning. And uh, this is the video that we got back from Perseverance. And so you can see Ingenuity sitting there. It's blade starting to spin as it ramps up to speed. And then there it goes. I I've watched this video, I don't know how many times at this point, um, but absolute history in the making. The very first powered controlled flight on another world. It is proven that it can be done. And now the Ingenuity team is going to just keep pushing the bounce and over the next, I believe, two or three weeks, um, keep kind of just experimenting and seeing what all Ingenuity can do. Um, so very, very exciting uh, news from Mars there. All right, well, let's jump into our program for tonight. Uh, I will leave me right there in the corner for now. All right, so as I said, um, tonight we're focusing on a beginner's guide to telescopes, and we're going to start off taking a look at the different types of telescopes that are out there, um, because some are actually more beginner-friendly than others, and since there's a lot of different telescopes out there, looking at a page full of them can seem overwhelming if you don't know what these words mean or don't know what it is you should be looking for. And so we're going to start with the basics of telescopes themselves. And the main telescope comes in three main types. The first type that we're seeing here is called a refractor or a refracting telescope. These were the very first telescopes made, um, and that was back in about 1608, and it actually wasn't Galileo. Um, the first telescope we believed was made by a lens maker, um, Hans Lippershey, I think is how you say his name. Um, Galileo heard about this design, made his own, and was, we believe, the first to use the telescope to look up at the night sky rather than use it for like navigational purposes on a ship or something. Um, but this basic design has two lenses. We have one big lens at the front of the telescope we call this the objective lens. And then we have a smaller lens at the back of the telescope, and this is your eyepiece. And so the idea is this main big lens here um, captures incoming light and focuses it towards the back 
of the telescope where the eyepiece then takes that light that came from the front and focuses it and magnifies the view to your eye so that you can see the night sky, the object you're looking at, uh, bigger than it would naturally appear to your eye. Um, now, with this being the kind of first telescope, um, this is also the type that tends to be the really, really cheap telescopes that you can find. Um, and these are not the best beginner telescopes because refracting telescopes do have this problem called chromatic aberration. The main idea is when that light passes through the lens, the different colors of the light are bent different amounts or refracted different amounts. And so the blue light gets bent a lot sharper than the red light. And so the final image that you see isn't one sharp color image, but you end up with the colors being kind of spread out. And um, this, this is a, a problem for all refractors. Now you can try and correct this by having a more complex lens, but that of course is going to cost more money. And so a, a really good refracting telescope that corrects as best as can be for this chromatic aberration is going to be very expensive. Um, and so I, I we recommend not looking at refracting telescopes for your first or beginner and definitely stay away from the super, super cheap plastic refracting telescopes uh, because you're, you're not going to have this corrected for and it's just going to be this blur of colors that doesn't look very good. So the uh, second type that telescopes can come in are reflecting telescopes. Um, this type of telescope was actually invented by Isaac Newton in 1668. And the idea is instead of having a big lens at the front of the telescope, this has a big mirror at the back of the telescope. And that mirror serves pretty much the same purpose as the lens did in the refracting. It collects the light coming into the telescope and focuses it out to an eyepiece. And that's our second piece, which is still a lens. Eyepieces are always lenses. The benefit to a reflecting telescope is you do not have that blur of colors because all colors bounce off of the mirror in the same way. So you naturally don't have to worry about that chromatic aberration that refracting telescopes have. That's not to say reflectors are without their uh, limitations. They do end up with, especially um, some of the, the cheaper reflectors, uh, then that price really comes into the shape of this mirror. It's a lot easier and cheaper to make this mirror um, spherical in shape. Um, and the problem with that is if you're looking at anything that's on the like edge, of your field of view, then that light doesn't get focused very well. But that's not that much of an issue because if you're looking at anything through the telescope, it's probably going to be centered in the center of your frame of view and centered works just fine. Things are focused just fine. Um, so it's not as big of an issue, um, especially if you know, you're only going excuse me, looking at one specific object or not trying to take like a picture of your entire field of view. Um, so because of the lack of that chromatic aberration, um, the simplicity and the design, reflectors make a really good beginner telescope. Uh, they don't have uh, a lot of maintenance to keep them um, up. Uh, that's another problem with the ref refracting telescopes because that lens sits right at the front. You often have to clean it. Um, with the mirror sitting in the back, you don't have to clean that as often or rarely at all. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to the reflecting telescope and it's very user friendly, beginner friendly. And so that's definitely the type that we recommend. Uh, but there is a third type of telescope that kind of combines the two. Uh, this is called a, called a compound or a catadioptric 
telescope, and it has both a mirror and a lens. Uh, and so we have a lens at the front and a mirror at the back. And the idea is to combine the best of both and to correct for the flaws that both have. And so the mirror helps to correct for some of the um, aberrations that the lens has. And the lens is made in such a way to correct for some of the problems that the mirror has when looking at things kind of at the edge of your view. Uh, and so you get kind of the best of both worlds here. Now that, of course, does mean you have a, a higher price tag for your compound telescopes. These tend to be much pricier. Uh, and so for a good kind of beginner um, telescope, this may not be what you want to look into just price wise. OK, um, so that's the basic telescope design. But telescopes also sit on a tripod or a mount, a telescope mount. And those mounts can themselves come in several different types of designs. The simplest design and the one that we recommend you look for is what we call an altitude azimuth mount. And that just means that the telescope, as you can see here, turns side to side and up and down. So it's a very intuitive motion, it's very easy to use, and therefore very beginner friendly, and doesn't require any um, specific instructions in setting it up. You just set up the tripod, put your telescope on it, and you're good to go. The other common type is what we call an equatorial mount. And this is a bit more complicated because the mount is designed to be lined up with the Earth's axis. So it would be lined up so it's pointed straight to the North Pole, towards Polaris, the North Celestial Pole. And the way it moves is more on arcs. Um, and so because of the, the movement not being as intuitive, and because you do have to have a very specific setup, it has to make sure you're set directly north, that your angle is lined up with the angle that the axis is, um, and so that's going to depend on your latitude. Um, these have a much steeper learning curve to them, and so we don't recommend equatorial mounts for beginners. Uh, definitely go with that altitude azimuth because it's a lot simpler to set up and a lot more intuitive to use. Another thing you may notice is telescope mounts come in, uh, sometimes they are computerized or what we call go-to mounts. And the idea with this is the mount itself has a little computer in it that has a database of objects so that you could type in, hey, I want to see Mars. And if Mars is up, the telescope will move to where Mars is. And there it is. You can see it. You don't have to move the telescope yourself. Um, the other advantage to it being computerized and motorized uh, means that it will automatically track objects across the sky because as the Earth spins, the stars and planets and everything move across the sky. And so if you want to keep watching one thing, you have to slowly move your telescope to track it. But these computerized ones will do that for you. And as great as that sounds, um, these do have their own learning curve to them. They're also more expensive because you're, you're basically buying a little computer. Um, but in order for this to work, when you first set up the telescope, you have to tell the computer, this is my location. That star is, say, Vega. That star is another star. And that allows the computer to kind of triangulate where you are so that it can get the correct map of your night sky. And if you don't know which stars are which, or you have trouble doing that sort of thing, you're not going to be able to take advantage of the computer in the go-to mount because you're not going to be able to set it up correctly and it's not going to know where it is. So because of that, um, these computerized, um, not just because of the price tag, but also because of that steeper learning curve and needing kind of a, a good basis and understanding of the night sky, these are definitely more intermediate to advanced telescopes and not the best for a beginner. So a few other things to consider 
um, when looking at getting a telescope is the aperture or the size of the opening. Um, and that becomes basically the size of the lens in the refracting telescope or the size of the mirror in the reflecting telescope. And in general, bigger is better because telescopes are basically giant light buckets. The bigger the telescope is, the bigger the aperture is, the more light you're able to collect and the brighter things are going to look. And so in general, you know, you want a bigger telescope, but there are drawbacks to that. Obviously a bigger telescope is going to be more expensive, but you also have to think about who is going to use it and where you're going to be using the telescope. Because as the telescope gets bigger and bigger, it becomes heavier, it becomes harder to move, and the eyepiece can also sit higher and higher off the ground. So you want to be thinking about, um, am I going to be taking this to different places? Am I going to have to carry this around? Uh, who is going to be using this? Is it going to be a bunch of younger kids who might need a step stool to get up there? Um, and so there are, are limitations when you start thinking in, in that realm uh, of how big a telescope you should get. Um, and so before we give our overall recommendations, I want to once again kind of warn to stay away from these really, really cheap big box store plastic telescopes. Um, I know they can be tempting because of the price tag, but that price tag, you are getting what you pay for. These are very small, so you don't see, I mean, they're, they're good for looking at like the moon and that's about it. They're very cheaply made, so the view that you get isn't very good. They like to try and draw you in with all of these pretty pictures on the box of what you would see and that's not what it would look like through that telescope. Um, the mount is also very flimsy, so it doesn't stay up very well. It's easy to knock over. It's easy to kind of knock it even just by walking around um, off target. And so there's, you get what you pay for. And we have seen um, that a lot of, especially younger kids who are excited about the night sky and want to have a telescope and explore it, if this is their first and only experience, they get so frustrated by it that they lose that interest. Uh, and so that, that is another reason why we try and, and talk people out of these super cheap ones because you're, you're not gonna get a good experience and it may actually turn someone away from an interest or a passion that they initially had. So with all of that said, here is what we recommend. We recommend a reflecting telescope on an altitude azimuth mount, an alt as mount. These are the simplest to use. Um, they are very user friendly and very beginner friendly. Um, and as for size, we recommend not going any smaller than a four inch telescope. So the mirror is four inches in diameter and not going any bigger than an eight inch diameter mirror. Um, we give that kind of four inch range because that is about the, as small as you can go and still be able to see like Jupiter and the moons around Jupiter, the rings of Saturn, and even some like deep sky objects like the Orion Nebula. Um, any smaller than that, it's really only good for the moon. Um, and we don't recommend much larger than an eight inch because you start running into the portability issues. Uh, it just becomes, unless it's going to stay in your backyard and not move, if you are going to try and travel with it, um, eight inches is about the limit that is really easy to travel with. Um, now, they do make a specific type of reflecting telescope on an alt as mount that we recommend, and that is what's called a Dobsonian telescope. Um, and what's specific about these is this kind of base that it sets on. So you have the tube of the telescope that sets on this base, and the base kind of spins around to give you that side to side, and then the telescope moves or kind of bends up and down, not bends, pivots up and down uh, to give you your up and down motion. 
The tube just sets on the base, so these two are easily taken apart so that you can carry the telescope tube and carry the base itself, but the two individual parts aren't very heavy, uh, and you can easily carry these and transport these as needed. Um, so with our recommendation for a four to eight inch Dobsonian telescope for the beginners, um, that still you might still have questions about brands because there are a lot of different telescope brands out there um, and we do want to give our recommendations for telescope brands but before i do that i want to clarify that we are in no way affiliated with any of these telescope brands we are not getting any sort of um payback or money from it uh, this is just from our personal experience uh, the brands that we have used and that we like. Um, so what I personally tend to recommend for a beginner telescope is an Orion SkyQuest. Um, this is a Dobsonian type telescope. This one here is a six inch, that's why it's XT6, and it's about $350. That is a pretty decent price for a beginner telescope that is very user friendly um, and will give you great views of not just the moon, but also planets and some other deep sky objects as well. Um, the great thing that Orion has is um, they will sell just the individual telescopes um, that often come with at least they all come with at least one eyepiece, um, and some may come with more than that. Um, but I also really like that the Orion brand sells these telescope kits for just a little bit more that come with some other accessories, like a red flashlight, which is always great to have if you're out observing, because the red color preserves your night vision, uh, so you don't end up losing that. And also has some like maps of the sky, um, it has uh, an eyepiece, what's called a Barlow lens, which helps give extra magnification to your eyepiece. Um, so for just a little bit more with this full kit, you can get a lot more to it. Um, now, I do have specific links to these two objects or to these two um, telescopes, the telescope itself and the telescope kit in the video description if you're interested. But other than that, these are some of the other very reliable telescope brands. Um, I already showed you Orion. Uh, Aperture and Skywatcher are two relatively newer brands, um, but they have uh, great recommendations from people that we trust. Um, a couple of the other two really, not common, um, um, prominent telescope makers are Mead and Celestron. Although my experience with both Mean and Celestron is more in their computerized telescopes. Um, so those two brands um, may be more for your, your second telescope, your intermediate level, when you might look at computerized. Um, but these are kind of the brands that we would recommend you stick to, um, just from our own personal experience or from recommendations from people that we trust. All right. Um, so let's say you have gotten your first telescope. Uh, what is a night observing going to look like, especially for the very first time that you use your telescope? Well, some telescopes do come with a little bit of assembly. That's not the, the telescope tube itself, but the tripod or the base that it sits on, you may have to put together. And that's the case for that Orion SkyQuest um, that I showed you. You have to kind of put the base together, but it's really simple. Um, once you have it all assembled, the next thing you're gonna need to do is align the finder scope. So most telescopes come with this little attachment called a finder scope. And this is basically a lower powered scope that helps you to align the telescope a lot easier. It has like this crosshair or it might have a little laser dot so that you can align that with the object you're looking for. And then when you look through the eyepiece of your telescope, you're on that object. But when you first put this together, you have to align everything up so that the center of your finder scope 
is centered with the center of your eyepiece. And I will say that this is probably, and I think Lindsay would agree with me, the most frustrating process in getting your telescope set up for the first time. Um, there are instructions that come with your telescope on how to do it. Um, but if you are having trouble, once we are back open, we, uh, Planetarium staff would be very happy to help you align your finder scope for the first time. Um, so once that process is done, then your telescope is pretty much ready to use. Um, next, you'll need to figure out what in the nighttime sky you want to look at, and that's where those star charts can come in handy. There's also a lot of phone apps that use your GPS coordinates, um, and so you can use something like that, but you need to figure out what in the sky am I going to look like. And then you just got to line your telescope up, and that's where that finder scope comes in handy. You line up that little laser points or the crosshairs, whatever your finder scope looks like, with, say, the moon. And then you look in your telescope and you may not see something very clear the first time because you have to focus it. And that's usually, there's usually a little knob near where your eyepiece goes uh, that you can twist. Uh, and you'll have to twist it in either direction. You'll figure out what looks better or which direction starts looking better or which starts looking worse uh, until you bring your image into focus. And then you have a beautiful view of whatever you're looking for. And that's the, the basics to using your telescope. Um, as I said, if you have a telescope and you are frustrated by it or you're um, having trouble using it and getting it set up, once we are back open in person, we can gladly help you out with that. Um, now, you may wonder, well, how can I zoom in on an object? Because uh, you may look at, say, Jupiter here, and it may look really small to you. Well, one way you can do, or the, the way you do this is by changing your eyepiece. Uh, different eyepieces give different magnifications or zooms. Um, but there is a couple of things to, to consider while you're doing this. You can see this really well with the Jupiter picture. That a different eyepiece does give me a bigger picture, but it's not as bright. And that's because you have the same amount of light being spread over a larger area. And so the object you're looking at may be dimmer and may be harder to see. Um, you can also see here with Saturn that there is a limit to how big you can magnify. And that specific limit does depend on your telescope. And the specs that come with your telescope will usually say what the magnification limit is. Um, so it might be like 200 times is the most magnification that you can get with your telescope. Um, other than that, uh, we're going to end tonight with um, a, a list of some really good beginner uh, targets. We tend to recommend looking at things that you can see with your naked eye. That makes it a lot easier to line up your telescope. So that would be the moon, the five planets that you can see naked eye, so Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, uh, comets. There are also some deep sky objects. These are things that are outside of our solar system that you can see with the naked eye that are great to look at. So that's things like the Andromeda Galaxy, the Pleiades Star Cluster, the Orion Nebula, the Great Globular Cluster, and Hercules, uh, which is one of my favorite uh, summertime objects to look at. Uh, and then you have like the double star in Albireo. There's lots of great things. Um, but to start with, as you're getting used to navigating the night sky, you definitely want to pick things that you can see with your eyes. And that makes it a lot easier to line up your telescope with. All right. Um, so that is the end of my spiel on telescopes. Uh, Lindsay, do you have any anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, no, just like you mentioned, you know, we, I've been using telescopes for a really long time and sometimes I still have trouble aligning my finder scope. So I don't wanna discourage anybody, but also know that if you're having trouble with that, like you're not alone. Um, and uh, lots of people have a lot of trouble. 
But the good thing is, once it's aligned, as long as you don't take the finder scope off or it doesn't get knocked, you don't have to align it again. It, it's, it stays aligned. Um, so this is something that you typically have to do once and then maybe adjust it, what, I, six months? I don't know. If that. I find mine every time because to put it in its my telescope in its case, I have to take the finder scope off. Yeah. Um, but if you are in a situation where you can leave it on, then you don't have to redo it every time. Um, but yeah. All right, uh, Eli, did we get any questions? No, no questions. No, all right. Um, well, if you do have any questions, now is a great time to leave them down in the comments. Um, I know we in the past um, have wanted to do like uh, telescope parties where people can bring their telescopes and we can help you get things set up. Um, COVID uh, kind of put an end to, to that plan. Um, but once we are back open in person, that is an event that we will start doing. Um, so you can bring your telescope and, and get help uh, getting it set up and learning how to use it. Um, I guess, oh, reminder, the Lear and Meteor Shower peaks tonight. Um, so if uh, you're able to kind of go out tonight, especially like after midnight, um, check out the Leard Meteor Shower. Um, that's going to, it's been going on for a few days now, but the peak happens tonight. Uh, and you just need to go find dark spots. Um, I know some of our favorite spots are like Hawk Ridge or Brighton Beach, but really just anywhere outside of the main Duluth area. And uh, take a look at the meteor shower tonight. Um, it's a moderate shower, so 10 to 15 meteors per hour, um, but it still should be a pretty good one. And I've checked the weather earlier and it looks like it's supposed to clear up tonight this is Duluth that could very quickly change um, but last I checked the weather it was supposed to clear up a little bit later it looks pretty good right now and they're yeah. kind of like they're kind of like toy story skies right now like you know you got the, <laughs> the clouds here and there but it looks pretty nice right now yeah so hopefully hopefully we have some clear skies tonight for that Okay, so we did actually just get a question. Okay. Um, and this is one that we are all asking ourselves as well. Um, I joined late, so apologize if you said anything about it, but do you have any idea when we will be able to open again? I do not have a specific date at the moment. Um, we are hoping this summer to be able to open for small private groups. Um, I'm still working on getting approval from the university on that. Uh, and as soon as we have information that will get posted, um, we will announce it. Um, as far as the full reopening, we are not sure yet. Um, but, but there is a lot of cool things happening behind the scenes. Um, we are actually getting a new uh, digital system. Um, and so we're gonna be installing that over the summer. We've also been working on some brand new shows. Uh, so once we do reopen uh, fully to the public, we're going to have some brand new stuff uh, that we're really excited to be able to open and show. Um, so we're going to do a big, like, grand reopening to show off all the new toys we have. Um, and it'll be fun. So, yeah, we, short answer, don't know yet. But I promise that as soon as we have dates, we will announce it. Mm -hmm. Um, but until then, we are going to keep doing our live streams on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Um, coming up, as I said at the beginning of the show, on Saturday, Lindsay is going to uh, give us a beginner's guide to astrophotography or taking images of the night sky. Um, and it's a lot easier than you may think. You don't have to have a lot of complicated or expensive equipment. Uh, and it's a really, really fun hobby to have. Uh, next week, on next Wednesday, we're going to do Star Wars Fact or Fiction, which is one of those new shows that um, Eli has been working on. Um, and so we'll take a look at the Star Wars universe and what is plausible based on real science and what is straight up made up fiction. Um, 
And then next Saturday is going to be the third installment of our exploration series. And we're going to take a dive into dark matter and dark energy. Because so we've brought up these things a few times in past shows, but we've never really, really explained what it is or how we know it exists. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do next Saturday. Um, and again, don't forget that May 22nd is our uh, astronomy day that we're going to be holding outside the planetarium. Um, we're going to be passing out fun um, activity kits uh, with things that you can make at home to do science. Uh, I'll give you a spoiler. This is one of those things, a little homemade spectroscope so that you can see the spectra. Um, but we'll, the activity kits will include the materials needed to make the items, um, information, instructions, uh, information on what exactly you're doing, and lots of other fun stuff as well. Um, so that is May 22nd. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's everything. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, and we hope you are able to get out and enjoy the meteor shower tonight. Um, otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your evening, and we will see you again next time. Bye, everyone.